fake military exercises uh, with live fly hijacking exercises and radar inserts. Yeah. Michael Rupert is one of the great heroes of the 9-11 movement. He was, uh, you know, he was there uh, long before most everybody else was. Paul Thompson's uh, great timeline that got me started. Paul gives Michael Rupert credit, says he got started with Michael. Um, with regard to that particular thesis, it's, it's one that I have not studied sufficiently to have uh, what I would call a really informed opinion on it. It's certainly very interesting that these exercises were going on, but as exactly how, what role they played that morning, I'm just uh, fairly agnostic. Uh, when it comes to uh, Rupert's more particular thesis about Cheney being the one who was in charge that morning and uh, calling the shots, that seems uh, very clear. So uh, we're clearly one on that, and I just say, on the other, I think it's probably very significant, but uh, I couldn't say anything more about it. Okay. Uh, next one, a uh, common question that we conspiracy theorists hear. <laughs> An inside job of this magnitude involves the conspiracy of a lot of people. How come there is no leak, nobody cracking, nothing? Thank you. Yeah. Let me say a word about uh, the term conspiracy uh, theory, uh, you know, it's, it's become almost uh, uh, an oath of being an American to say, oh, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. But, uh, uh, of course, in your newspaper every day is filled with uh, stories of conspiracies. Whenever two or more people get together to do something illegal or immoral, that's a conspiracy. And if you've got an idea of what happened, you have a conspiracy theory. So we all have we all are believers in conspiracy theories. And the official story about 9-11 is the mother of all 9-11 conspiracy theories. Uh, this is the theory that uh, these 19 Arab Muslim hijackers, uh, without any help from anybody in the United States, uh, out-tricked our trillion dollar uh, military defense system and uh, pulled this off and knocked down these buildings. Um, well, the question is not whether you believe in a conspiracy theory or not, but which theory stands up to the evidence. Another thing to, to point out is that as uh, James Fetzer, a philosopher of science who is now getting involved in the 9-11 truth movement, has pointed out, theory is sometimes a very strong word. We have the theory of gravitation, you know, relativity theory. We have quantum theory. These are very precise theories. The point is they're testable. A, 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 a conspiracy theory is fine if it's testable. Well, fortunately, the government's theory is testable. You can test, can steel frame high-rise buildings fall down solely because of fire? And they've actually done experiments to try this, and they've never been able to get a building to even come close to collapsing. So it's a testable theory, which has been falsified. And I've indicated several other aspects that are, uh, uh, I think, clear falsifications of the official theory. Now, the question, uh, all sorts of questions can be then raised, sort of a priori questions. Well, why, why would they do this? And I raised some of those in my book, if you read, uh, what, chapter 9 of the New Pearl Harbor. There are lots of puzzling questions. Uh, I thought the first question was going to be, you know, what happened to Barbara Olson? Then uh, that's always the first one. Uh, I don't know. There are all of these things. And uh, so is it possible that very many people could be involved in a conspiracy and keep it silent for a long time? Well, yes. Remember the Manhattan Project. A lot of people were involved in that, and that was kept secret for a long time. And we've looked back. Now we know that lots of uh, previous conspiracies were kept silent for a long time. Uh, America's first uh, attack in Indonesia, we had a full-scale war going on there. And until a book was published on it in uh, the late 90s, hardly any Americans knew about it. It was kept secret for a very long time. If you add to the fact that uh, we do have other instances, the fact that people um, 
many of the people involved are, are government or, and, and military and other government employees who take an oath, like these FBI guys. They've taken an oath of obedience. If they violate that, see, they want, they, they, they're hoping shippers could, I, I don't know what's happening now, but originally they were evidently hoping that shippers could get a trial so they could be subpoenaed, in which case they would have to testify, and that would free them from prosecution. But if they just come out and talk, then they're prosecuted, they're sent, sent to prison for the rest of their lives maybe, they can't support their families. And then in some cases, people are told, well, you know, Joe, if uh, you start talking about this, somebody's going to get really mad at you, and I don't know how we're going to protect your wife and kids. Would you talk? Particularly when there's, no receptive, there's nobody asking you to come forward. Did the 9-11 Commission make a general appeal and say, please, if you've got any information on this, come and talk to us? No. Nobody was invited other than government employees. And so if you go to the, uh, the, the mainstream media, they ridicule you. So who's going to risk their, their family's life to come forward? So no, I am not surprised that a rather large number of people could be involved. And uh, also, you know, we have previous examples of uh, things that went on and people who knew got killed. How many in people who had apparently had some knowledge about uh, JFK's assassination ended up dead? A lot of people know about that, so they know what can happen. So no, I'm not surprised. But the fact is that nevertheless some people are trying to come forward. These FBI agents. Sibel Edmonds has been trying to come forward and, and tell her story for many, many months. Now. As I report in my book on the 9-11 Commission report, she testified to the commission for three and a half hours. She told them very specific things. She's since then written a public letter, to an open letter to Chairman Kane, reminding him of what she told the commission, such as that their Iranian asset had told them uh, uh, that Osama bin Laden, he was an expert on Afghanistan, that Osama bin Laden was planning an attack in the United States uh, pretty soon. Uh, the translator who got that information was told to keep quiet within the FBI. Uh, she told the FBI about that. That other translator told the FBI in his two and a half hours of testimony. None of that appears in the 9-11 Commission report. All that you learned that Sibel Edmonds, one tiny little note says that she had some suggestions that FBI should follow its own policies a little more closely. That's all you learned from her. Three and a half hours of testimony. So she has been coming, trying to come forward and uh, some other people too, and they've lost their jobs. So people are. Okay, here's a question on source validation methodology. Who are your sources, and what standards did you employ to validate <laughs> these sources? Yeah, in the, in the New Pearl Harbor, I did rely primarily on uh, the four sources that I cited the most. Uh, uh, Ahmed's, uh, Nafiz Ahmed's book, but he relied also a lot on uh, Paul Thompson and also used Michel Chosdowski, the economist in uh, Canada. Uh, Paul Thompson, one thing interesting about his timeline, and now he's published his book as the Terror Timeline, he used only mainline sources. So New York Times, Boston Globe, The Guardian, London Times, and so on. I don't even think he quoted the nation. I mean, he really stuck to what are considered really mainline sources, and yet found hundreds of stories that contradicted the uh, official account. As to uh, method, you know, it's uh, very partly you, you just have to learn to trust uh, your, your kind of uh, educated judgment. I've, I've gotten into a lot of previous fields. My, my work at the Center for Process Studies called for me to organize conferences in a lot of fields, uh, 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 philosophy of physics, uh, Eastern religions, Chinese religions, Asian, uh, Buddha, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, political theory, uh, economic theory. So in each case, I had to go in and start reading around and learning 
who were the generally considered respectable writers and then who were the ones who maybe weren't so respectable but were good and uh, had something important to say outside the mainstream and so on. So um, I think method is, is in that sense more of a sort of trained judgment about these things. And of course, uh, people can differ on these things. But I did, and I, I limited myself to stories that I found to be at least uh, highly plausible. But I did not commit myself, as, as those of you who have read the book, to say, I know these stories are true. I mean, there are hundreds of stories there. And uh, a single researcher like myself or Paul Thompson, uh, we don't have the resources. So what we're calling on is we're saying, there is a prima facie case here for a genuine investigation. We've got organizations that have the money to carry out uh, investigations like that. They're called the US Congress. They're called the US media, which have billions of dollars. So the question is, what method are they using? <laughs> Ignoring. OK, where do we go from here? Uh, how do we get through to a brainwashed electorate led by money and power? Next question. <laughs> we invite C-SPAN. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, uh, this is really a historic event. Uh, you know, when the uh, hearings were being uh, uh, were going on. C-SPAN covered those and covered some of the discussions that occurred afterwards with some of the 9-11 families. And uh, Kyle Hintz of 9-11 uh, Citizens Movement was able to make a statement which C-SPAN did cover and so that did get conveyed to the American people. But to my knowledge, maybe C-SPAN can correct me, but to my knowledge this is the first event in which uh, this kind of major presentation, the full hour presentation, has been made and covered. So uh, this might be the beginning of something big. We'll see. Isn't it true that CIA officials met with Osama bin Laden when he was being operated on in a hospital shortly before 9-11? This seems to be true. It was reported by a uh, very reputable uh, a Swiss journalist uh, and picked up by several uh, European newspapers, uh, including some British newspapers, uh, by uh, just accidentally, I guess, by no American uh, newspaper. But that uh, in July of 2001, when Osama bin Laden was already the number one wanted man in the world, um, the report is that uh, he went to a hospital in uh, Dubai, the American hospital, was treated by an American surgeon and visited by the local CIA agent as well as by the head of Saudi intelligence. Um, so it appears that this is one of the many of the stories I tell in the New Pearl Harbor that suggests that the uh, relationship between the Bush family and uh, the bin Laden family isn't maybe exactly what we've been told. And of course, uh, we have a full length book on that. House of uh, Bush, House of Saud. And uh, in fact, let me say a word about that. Uh, that part of Michael Moore's movie, um, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on the guy's name who wrote House of Bush, House uh, of Saud. Unger, Craig Unger. Craig Unger, yeah. Uh, I was very grateful. He, he, he co corresponded with me on this. And if you remember after the movie, when uh, Michael Moore's movie got trashed so much by mainline critics, uh, movie critics telling him he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, they said that this idea that uh, any Saudi flights were allowed to go before other si flights were allowed to go was just false. And uh, 
what Craig Unger had reported was that on the February, uh, excuse me, September 13th, 